in every facet of life. We are surrounded by intentional design. From agriculture to Fortune 500 companies, everything happens as a result of careful planning and design. We realize the destiny God has for us through designing a life worth living. Join us now for Designing Your Destiny. Yeah, the card, go Cardinals, man. They, they won last night, so I got to have my Cardinals jacket on. It was a great game, great game. Just, you know, uh, love my team. But, you know, I don't want to be one of those people that just, uh, like, you know, I feel like a proud parent. But, you know, some of these parents have bumper stickers about all their kids and stuff. So some of you, you shouldn't have to be subjected to that. So I'm just, I'll take this off for you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's got to be who you are, you know. We're going to be encouraging you, if you have a football jersey, to wear it on Super Bowl Sunday. We do that every time, every Super Bowl. But this coming Super Bowl Sunday, this coming Super Bowl Sunday weekend, we have invited the Power Team. They've been around for 30 years. I don't know if you've heard of them before. They're uh, they, a traveling group of, uh, of guys, two of the guys that are on the team currently are NFL guys, currently in the NFL starting, and they, uh, they do feats of strength, and so we, we actually have to go down to uh, the lows. They gave us a list of stuff to get, rebarb and different things, and they're going to bend things into pretzels and do all these crazy feats of strength, so it'll be kind of fun, and if you're into that thing, you could be pretty jazzed, but we're really not doing it for you, per se. We're doing it for people you know. We want to be an inviting church. And so if you know people that would like to see feats of strength, it's quite, a, it's quite an event. In fact, this service will be affected the most. Uh, they can't do their presentation in the amount of time that we have for the 930 service. So on Super Bowl Sunday morning, we're going to have to move it to 9. So you might want to keep that in mind. And so it'll start at 9 o'clock because it's going to take them about an hour and 15 minutes to do uh, their presentation, which is an evangelistic. They, it's really evangelism, and this is kind of the gifts that God's given them, and so that they, uh, they do that. So uh, I encourage you to be praying about bringing somebody, maybe bringing a few people, inviting them, and uh, we're going to believe that God's going to really do something great, and it'll be a terrific Super Bowl for a lot of people, uh, regardless of who wins, if, they, if we find people who uh, come to Christ through this, okay? So that's just uh, something you can be thinking about, praying about, and inviting people to. Today, though, we are in our series on designing your destiny, and we're looking at about uh, what would our life look like uh, maybe in 10 years out, uh, that if you don't do anything different than you're currently doing. Your life is likely to be just like it is 10 years from now as it is today. And uh, your, your life will either, either go, through, go, go on by default or design. Most people live by default. They just, however life comes at them, it's kind of, they're just juggling stuff, they're busy, they never take time to plan and think about it. And so what we've asked you to do is just be part of a small group, a connect group, and uh, together, church-wide, we're saying, let's plan out the next 10 years. And this is just interesting topics to talk about. Hey, wouldn't that be nice to do? And that's really all that happens unless you do it. Unless you carve out time, you say, I'm actually going to do that. And, 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 to do that means you have to have vision. But see, a lot of people, they're visionless. They've lost that. Maybe they had it at one time, and then something derailed that, and then they just have no vision. And when you don't have a vision that's, that's drawing you, you end up frittering away your life. You end up not doing well. The Bible calls it perishing. Notice here, it says, at the top of your outline, where there is no vision, the people perish. See, if you don't have a vision for your life, you end up perishing. Vision uh, is the Hebrew word hazan, and it literally means to dream. Know that you have a dream for your life. You have a vision for your life. You have goals. You, you know where you're going. It's, it's moving you along. Otherwise, you just end up drifting. You don't have a life purpose. You don't have objectives. You perish. Now, everybody knows what perishing is, right? You go to the grocery store, you buy some fruits and vegetables, throw them in your fridge, and you forget about them. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I bought that lettuce and that celery. Is that you open up your crisper and it perished, right? 
this isn't good. It smells. It's a mess. That's a good illustration about our life. When we don't have vision, we perish. We perish. Perish is the word Hebrew word para, which literally means out of control. In other words, when you have something controlling your life, you have vision. It's giving parameters. It's, it's helping you to decide how to use your time efficiently and wisely. When you don't have vision, you have no, those controls aren't there. And you're out of control, and then you start feeling like a victim, and all of a sudden, all the circumstances around you are controlling your life instead of the vision that God has for your life. Now, a lot of people, they are out of control because they put, they have their vision in the wrong things. They're thinking that maybe, you know, they look at the economy or they look for politics or they look for business. They're, they're looking for things and then they, all of a sudden, those outward things don't give them the control and then they feel like a victim. Now, we're going to be looking at an interesting story that talks about, talks about vision. And it's about this blind man. So I'm going to give you a little background for that. And, um, and then we'll read the story together, and then we'll kind of break it apart a little bit. The background is Jesus is on his way uh, to Jerusalem. It's his last week before he's going to be arrested. He will be, he will be killed. He'll be uh, crucified. And then he'll be raised from the dead three days later. It's all part of his plan. But he's moving down. This is his last week. There's throngs and throngs of crowds. He's very busy. He has a lot on his mind. And he's going from town to town, and he's working his way from Galilee all the way down to uh, Jerusalem, and he stops off at a couple towns. One of those cities is Jericho. Jericho, as he comes up with all these crowds, there's blind people begging at the city gates. This is very common in, in, in the Middle East during that time. I mean, there's, th that's what people did if they were blind. They, th they begged. There's nothing else you could do. See, today, if you're blind, you can, be, you can lead a very productive life. I mean, we have seen eye dogs. We have uh, street lights that have Braille on them so that you know when uh, the light is red or green. Uh, we have uh, computer technology that you can speak and it's voice activated. There's th uh, Braille 3D printers. There are uh, apps you can put on your phone that have facial recognition that t help you read a menu, tell you what c color you're looking at. Um, all kinds of things. You can be a very productive uh, navigation features. But in that day, it wasn't that way. If you were blind, you, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't work. You couldn't get around. You couldn't <clears throat> read or write. You were, you, you, all you could do is just depend on the pity of people. And so each day you just get up, you'd find your way to the city gates where you, people, there was a lot of traffic, and then you would just beg all day. And that was his life. And so uh, Jesus comes by Jericho and has this encounter with this guy who is blind. He's blind. He has, he has no vision. He's living a miserable life because he can't see. Luke 18, if you have your Bibles, you open up Luke 18. And it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. <clears throat> when he heard the crowd was going by, he asked, what's happening? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way, that's the crowd that's all around him, the ones in front of him, rebuked the blind man, and they told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped and he ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? This is a profound question. We're going to look at this in just a moment. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, Bartimaeus replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God, when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Helen Keller, the great philanthropist, she was, she was born blind and deaf. She was once asked, isn't that a tragedy for somebody to be born, to, to somebody to be blind? And, she, and she, her famous reply was, it's a greater tragedy to have eyes and to not see. She's talking about vision. She's saying that you might have your eyes and think, oh, how blessed I am. But if you don't have vision, you're just kidding yourself. Oh, sure, it's great to have eyes, but living a life without purpose, without vision, knowing where you're going, what God's called you for this, why you're even on this planet. That is a shame. 
That's why it's worth taking time and saying, you know what? What am I here for? What is my, what is my vision for my life? What is my vision for my marriage? What's the vision for my kids, for my career, for my health? All those things. And that's what we want to take January, beginning of 2016, and ask those questions and create some time in our life and say, hey, this is important. This is worth discussing. As we set a, t- 10 years out, because your whole life, for most of you, looks like a long way out. <laughs> some of you are going, it's not that far for me. You know? But for most of us, we think, oh, it's, and it's just kind of overwhelming your whole life. So that's why, but if it's just one year, then if, if you're supposed to, if you're sensing you're maybe going to make a career change or you need to get retooled in education, then that just feels so small. So 10 years is, is a good benchmark. It's not a magic number, but it's a good benchmark. 10 years, what can God do? What, what, what am I supposed to be? And what am I going to be doing in my life in 10 years? And so uh, what, when you answer that question, that determines a lot of things. It determines your success level. It determines your stress level. It determines your strength level. When you start to figure out what, what you're supposed to be doing with your life what, 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 and what God wants you to do with your life. Now, God brought you here today because he wants you to nail that down. He wants you to figure that out. What is your vision for your life? God wants to restore your vision if you've lost it. So let's look at this story. Bartimaeus, in receiving his sight, his vision, really we draw from that ways that we restore our vision. Okay, and we're going to look at that. The first one is is you do what Bartimaeus did. Believe Jesus can change my situation. Begins with hope. Believing things don't have to stay the same. If they've been that situation long enough and you've tried very, very hard to change it and you see no way out, you can feel hopeless. Right? You can feel hopeless. I've tried everything I know. I've spent money. I've gone to counseling. I've worked so hard. I've read books. I've done this. And you start to feel like, Well, you feel hopeless. That's really what it is. And this is all about hope, that God can change things. No matter how hard you've tried, no matter how long you've lived in your situation, God can still change it. And this is what this blind guy believed. Jesus could change his situation. And uh, beginning of this, verse 35, it says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He cried out, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Now imagine this. There's it's not just him, there's there's a lot of blind people probably there at the gate. And yet he's the one calling out. Other people are probably thinking, well, you know, who do you think you are? You know, that's rude. Why are you even doing that? Even the crowd turns against him. And so here he is. He's, he's taking a step out, though. He's thinking, hey, I'm believing. He starts crying out. He starts yelling, Jesus, have mercy on me, son of David. It's really a cry, more than just a cry of desperation. It is that, but even more than that, it's a cry of hope. Sometimes in desperation, we, there's not necessarily hope. Here he's believing, I think something's going to change. Jesus has the ability to change me. The reason why people lose hope is because they put their hope in the wrong thing. If you put your hope in the economy, then on Friday, this past Friday, you kind of, you get discouraged. All of a sudden, wow, I just, you know, it can tank that quick. You put your, your hope in who gets elected, you know, you're hoping it's Sanders or Trump or whoever, then even if that person ends up in the office, you put your hope in that stuff and then it's just, you're putting your hope in the wrong thing and you just get discouraged. Now, you could put your hope in the Cardinals. <laughs> and some of you, this is about your time, this is the time to sign up. No, I'm, I mean, even, no matter what you put your hope in, you put your hope, there's only one thing to put your hope in, right? It's God. He's the one who can really change your circumstance. He's the one who's, who, who, who if, we, if you follow God's path for your life, you won't be disappointed. Because it's the reason you were born. It's the reason you're here. It's your purpose. First Peter 1 says, God paid for you with the precious life blood of Christ. 
Because of this, you can trust. Your trust can be in God who raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Now your faith and hope can rest in him alone. It's in Christ alone. That's where our faith rests. And so that's, instead of getting distracted on a bunch of other things. Now Bartimaeus, he had lost his vision, but he gets his vision because he's, he, and there's a lot of ways to lose your vision. In this case, it's physical, right, with Bartimaeus. But as we discussed, you can lose your vision, your spiritual vision. You just lose your way. You just don't know what you're supposed to be doing with life. You don't know, you don't have a connection with God. And so getting your vision back is important. And the first thing is believe God can change it. Number two, ignore all the negative voices. There's a lot of negative voices out there. People that that are wandering generalities. They're not meaningful specifics. They don't have a hope that's driving them. They don't have a clear vision. And so if, when you start to say, declare that about yourself, there's not going to be a lot of people that are cheering you on. A lot of people, they don't want you to have the brass ring. They don't want you to go for it. They don't want to see you succeed. That's just the way human nature is because misery loves company. They're miserable in their little plot of life and they don't want you to be successful and happy and, and, and making a significant impact. And so you have, to avoid, you have to be careful of that. And uh, don't let all that stuff uh, get, get the best of you. If you, start, if you start trying to figure out what God's doing in your life and then you start sharing that, you're going to have a lot of people say, oh, you can't ever achieve that. That's not a dream. That's a pipe dream. You know, well, who do you think you are? Why do you think you can do anything specific or, or, or important? And so you got to be careful. You know, Jesus said at one point, he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. In other words, things that are important to you, be careful who you share them with. Now, you might not want to quote that exact verse with that person. Well, the reason I'm not sharing with you is they might read between the lines on that, right? You calling me a swine? But it's true. You got to, when God put that vision in Mary's heart, she, it says she pondered it in her heart. She didn't start going around sharing it right away. It was too big. And she knew that she might not get support. So she had to really think about it and pray about it, make sure that she was, she was figuring it out. So here Bartimaeus, he's yelling out, you know, I want something to change. I believe Jesus can change my situation. And, all, and, and the crowd is not on his side. They're, they're the ones heckling him, saying, hey, shut up, Right? says, those who led the way, that's the beginning, that's the part of that crowd, says they rebuked him, and they told him to be quiet. But he just shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. What's the crowd doing? They're just telling him, he's too important for you. You're just a beggar. You're just a blind beggar. That's all you are. You are nothing special. Now, one of the biggest negative voices in our lives are our, is our own voices, our own hear, we, what we hear say to ourselves. I don't deserve that. I'm not special. Surely Jesus wouldn't take time to bless me. And we say that to ourselves. And sometimes we're our, our own worst critic. And so part of avoiding negative feedback is making sure you don't do that to yourself. You don't shoot yourself in the foot. Instead of saying, well, you know, God might want to bless a nun or a missionary or so a saint or something. No, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you, even though we're, we, don't, we recognize, well, I'm nobody special. Well, nor was Bartimaeus. That's the point of the story. Jesus doesn't just tell these, these stories. There's a lot of healings that happen. But the Bible put together some for us to say, okay, see what God can do. And then the, and then the message is he wants to do it for you as well. And so you have to make sure and not fall into that. You know, one of the problems that we have is, is when we care too much about what other people think. You know, when we're thinking, well, what if so-and-so disapproves? And, and if we really want somebody's approval, we're, we're going to miss what God has for us. Because we're, you have to either decide, am I, what, do I, what do I fear more, the disapproval of other people or the disapproval of, approval of God? Because you really can't have both. No matter who it is, there's going to be a, a kid or a parent or a spouse or a coach or a boss. There'll be somebody, and a, 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 another person at work, who if you're, if you're all concerned about what they think, that'll cause you to, to veer off. 
In fact, if, you're, if you have, the, if you have a, a, a fear or an anxiety about what people think about your decisions, that's actually a disability. Some, some of you, you have disabilities, and maybe they're, they're, they're obvious to others. This is an emotional disability. Notice what it says here. It says uh, in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of human opinion disables you. It means you have a disability if you're concerned, if you, if you have the fear of other people's opinions of you. That, that's a genuine disability. Fear of human opinion disables you. Trusting in God protects you from that. So you have to make a decision. Who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to what God says or what other people say or what I say about myself? You know, it's interesting when we're so concerned about what other people think of us, a lot of times people aren't thinking about us at all anyways. You know, you go to a party and everybody's thinking about themselves. And we're thinking, well, I wonder what people are thinking about what I'm wearing. Well, they don't, they're probably not because everyone's thinking the same thing, right? <laughs> You show, show somebody a picture of, a, of a, a group photo, first thing you do is you look for yourself, right? If you don't like the picture, it's not a good picture. Right? No, no, we don't want that. Everybody else might look great, but it's not a good photo because you're not good. So th when you, that's really the way people are wired. And so why be so concerned about that? You're concerned about what God says. Number three, you must listen to God's call. This is God's wanting to get your attention. So you have to pay attention to God. You can't be so busy that you don't take time to hear from God. <coughs> Verse 49 says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. He's talking to this, uh, uh, about this blind guy. He says, so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. You can circle that. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he, Bartimaeus, jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. You know, it's interesting, he says he's calling you, calling and vision go together. The reason is because your calling is the vision that God wants you to have. They, they go, there's, they're one and the same. Sometimes when we think of calling, it sounds kind of uh, spiritual, spooky, whatever. Yeah, calling, but the truth is God has, is, is everybody on the planet is called. Everybody is called. Everybody's called to love God. Everybody's called to serve Him. Everybody's called to enjoy God's presence. Everybody's called to go to heaven. Just not everybody listens. Not everybody answers the phone, right? Not everybody picks it up, but God's, the calling is out there, <clears throat> and God calls us. And when we think of the word like uh, vocation in, in business, we usually think, well, that's your, your, your career choice. That's your job, and it is that, but, you know, vocation is that word, voca is a, um, a Latin word that means that means voice. It's where we get vocals or this idea of calling. It's what your calling is. And everybody has a calling. Not every, we have unique callings as well. Some people are called to be work in the school. Some, some people are called to raise kids. Some in engineering. Some to drive a truck. Uh, some are musicians. There's all kinds of callings out there. But here's one thing that is true about a calling is, is that you're good at it. Now, I, I love music, and I'm glad some people are called to be musicians because I enjoy listening to music. But or, there was a time when I was, I was uh, <clears throat> singing for uh, my small group and different events, and I, I had a great time. <laughs> but other people didn't really care for the way my voice was. That's important because that's part, sometimes people get confused about that. Just because you enjoy something doesn't necessarily mean it's your calling. <laughs> right? It might just be a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> you're good at it. You're calling. You're going to be good at it because God designed you that way. He wired you that way. And Bartimaeus, when Jesus called him, he could have missed his calling. He could have been so, so consumed with himself, yelling out over and over that he didn't even hear the fact that Jesus was calling him. So he, he dialed down. He, he, you know, there's a point when he could listen. And that is an important part of, listen, of, of discovering our calling is through, is through listening, taking some time, extended time. And specifically, I'm kind of talking about prayer. Now, most of us here, I would imagine, pray uh, some, you know, maybe over dinner or over your kids or something. You know, we, you're almost getting an accident and you're driving away. You're, 
you know, a little prayer. Thank you, God. That was close. But when you're talking about something as important as your life, as your purpose, you're going to need more than that. You're going to need a little more extended prayer time. Now, we talk about prayer in, in our Vineyard 101. We talk, teach you some things that help you in, in prayer. And, and when you're talking about extended prayer, that's, that's hard for a lot of people. The Hebrew says prayer is work. It's not easy. So don't kid yourself. That's one of the reasons why it's hard. Why? Because it's work. Well, work, there's, there's the idea, there's labor that's involved in it, which prayer is. And so when I pray, if I'm going to pray for an extended period of time, I try to find, it does, there's no like special, you don't have to like be uh, on your knees with your hands folded. I mean, there's no special, you know, position, but I like to find something, someplace comfortable. Because if I'm real uncomfortable, I probably, I probably won't pray as, you know, as long. So I want to be, but I don't want to be too comfortable. You know, I don't like pray in my bed when the sheets are all warm and, 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 uh, you know, that's not a good place. See, that's called sleep for me. <laughs> so if I'm going to pray, I want to, I'll go down and, and sit on the couch or maybe sit on the, lay on the rug looking up. I don't close my eyes, you know, because that that's, doesn't help me. Or maybe I'll take a walk and I'll be praying. And I like to have my hoodie. You know, the, back in the day, they used to have prayer shawls. So you put it, something over you. <clears throat> my hoodie is my prayer shawl. <laughs> Just kind of put my hoodie on, walk around, because I'm, I'm praying. I'm, I'm focused on what God's, you know, and, and prayer also involves not just talking. I don't just sit there and talk the whole time. I'll, I'll, sh I'll talk a little bit and then I'll listen and, and ask God to speak to me. And, and that's part of that process. So there's, and, and it's something we grow into. This is a time for you to do that. It's, it's, it's a time when you carve out time for God, where you say, God, I want you to show me. You don't just create something on your own. You're, ask, you're wanting to hear what God has for you. That's the key. And God will speak to you. Isaiah 30 says, And repentance and rest is your salvation. He's talking about dialing down and resting in God and, and experiencing in quietness and in trust is your strength. That's where we get our strength from. Our strength, so many, so many times we're looking for strength through pills or through programs, through TV, through a person, but our strength really comes from quietness and trust in God and then spending some time with him and, and letting God speak to us. It's interesting here, the crowd, notice how they've changed. Before they're, they're telling them to shut up. Now they're telling them to cheer up, right? Crowds are fickle. So, you know, they're all of a sudden they changed. Hey, hey, cheer up. Things are good now. Earlier they're yelling at him, right? Rebuking him. Notice it says, throwing his cloak aside, this is Bartimaeus, jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And circle that word, jumped. See, he didn't procrastinate. You've heard you jumped at the opportunity. So many times we, we, we delay, we wait, we just hover instead of moving. When God, there's, a, there's an element where we're jumping into it. We're getting involved. You jump at the opportunity. You say, what's the next step for me? For some of you, your next step is to, is to be baptized. I mean, he jumped, in, he jumped up right in front of everybody. He didn't care that all these people are around. And, and we're, we're doing a baptism on Palm Sunday weekend. Palm Sunday weekend. And, and for some of you, that's the time you need to, that's the next step for you. Hey, I need to get my spiritual life in order. And God calls me to be baptized. That's part of what it means. We didn't make that up. Jesus said that. He said, my followers will be baptized. Some of you might have gotten baptized as an infant, and that's great. But as we read scripture, we don't see infant baptisms. There's none. We see people, believers' baptisms, people that have, now that's when, so we got baptized like I did as an infant. That was what my parents did for me. I'm thankful that they did that. That's cool. But that didn't, at some point, I had to make a decision to follow Christ. I made a decision to get baptized. And so for some of you, that's where you're at. You need to take that next step for me. For yourself, I want to get baptized. I want to, I want to take that next step. Number four, tell God exactly what you want. This is important. Luke 18, 40 says, when he came near, that's Bartimaeus, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Now, it's simple here. He doesn't get into a long, elaborate thing. It's, it seems to be a, a pretty condensed thing. I want to see. It's just, but he understood it. 
He knew exactly what he wanted. If Jesus were here today in front of you, just saying, what do you want me to do for you? Could you succinctly say, this is what I want? That's what we're talking about, being clear about that, knowing this is what I want God for me, God God to do in my life. And and I suggest that you have that uh, in different areas of your life. This is what I want God to do financially. This is what I want happened in my life, in my health. This is what I want in my marriage. This is what I want with my kids. This is what I want in my spiritual growth track. This is, this is, where I, this is what I want in my, my maturity in, in Christ. I, I, having a clear understanding in, in the different areas of my life. Now, when we talk about setting goals, one of the challenges that we often have is, is well, what if God what if that's what if I don't get it right? I mean, what if God later on, you know, reveals to me he wants me to have a different, you know, change some things up? Well, then you let him. But you, as that's part of the hearing, the discerning process. As we're as the Bible says, we hear in part, we see in part. As we're getting pieces like pieces of a puzzle, you 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 put them together. If you realize, oh, that piece really goes over here, then you just change it. That's not a reason not to build the puzzle. That just means oh, I have some flexibility as I start to realize this piece really goes over there. I just move it over and I don't get all upset. God has permission to make changes to my, to my life goals. And so we still set goals. Bartimaeus, he, he didn't have his necessarily written down, but he knew, he knew what he wanted. And he had courage to ask and he asked publicly. You know, secret faith really is shallow faith. The demonstration that we have strong faith is when we're willing to publicly talk about it. We talk about our faith. We talk about our faith in Christ with people that don't know Christ. We also talk about what God's, the dream that God's put in our life. That's part of, that's part of having strong faith, believing in a dream enough that you can talk about it. I love this verse in Romans 8, 32. It says, since God did not spare even his own son, in other words, he sent Jesus to die for us, but gave him up for, for us all. God loved us. He sent Jesus on the cross. Won't God, who gave us Christ, also give us everything else? See what he's saying? He's saying that God cared enough for you on what really mattered your eternity. Wouldn't he care for all the things between now and when you die? I mean, if, he, if, he, if God cared enough and loved you enough to send his son to die for you on the cross so that you could have eternity with God, wouldn't he care enough for you to take care of your health and your finances and the things, just the day-to-day things in life? It says that's, we, we can trust that God's going to watch over us. He cares about us. And then the fifth step that we see in this story is, is you receive vision and faith. There's a faith element to vision where we step into that. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. And so you have these things going together, receiving and, and believing. In other words, there's, they, they're one, one kind of connects to the other. And so part of walking out what God has for us is believing that, you know, God has the, God's going to change me. And we put our faith in, in Jesus, knowing that Jesus is the one who's truthful. He's the one who, 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 who knows all about us. And he's the one who is, uh, who is going to take care of us. You know, it's interesting with this Bartimaeus fella, he didn't even have a relationship with Jesus and Jesus healed him. Jesus worked powerfully in his life. He wasn't one of the disciples. He wasn't one of the followers of Christ. He was just sitting there at the gate and he just has a request, just kind of belts it out. And Jesus says, he hears him and he he honors this guy's request. Sometimes we think, well, if I'm not really close to God, he's probably not going to give me something. But that's not true. The truth is, is God cares so much for us, no matter what we've done, no matter where we're laying, begging at some street, he cares enough. If we ask, he, he'll come along and he, he, he wants you to live out your purpose more than you do. That's why he created you. And so he's, he's wanting to give you those gifts. So there's this element where we, we have faith, we believe. God's going to help me out. First, or J- there in uh, John 1, it says, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. In other words, just, we all have these blessings. We, sometimes we're not even aware of it. Romans 4 says, that's why faith 
is key. Faith is key. God's promise is given to us as a free gift. And then number six, stick with Jesus on the road. He travels. The reason is because vision leaks. Sometimes we, we, we get a vision and then if we don't revisit that, if we're not staying close to God, we end up drifting many times. Verse 43 it says, immediately he, that's Bartimaeus, received his sight and he followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they praised God. Now, this story is told in two different gospels. The other one is in Mark. And in Mark's account, it's added, he regained his sight and began following Jesus on the road. So th here's this extra piece. The, the very first verse we looked at, it, said, uh, it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside. And now this last verse is it's he followed Jesus by the road. So there's these like two options, two options. He had two options we have. You can, we can either sit by the road waiting for things to happen, being a victim of our circumstances, or we can get up and we can say, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus. When, when, when Bartimaeus got up this morning, that morning, he didn't know his whole life was going to change. It was going to be like every other day. He probably just thought, oh, here's another day, just like a thousand other days. I'm going to have to go sit at the city gate and beg and just sit in the dirt in the hot sun. But things changed for him. And when things changed, he said, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus on the road. I, that's where I want to be. And you have that, that same choice. You see, Jesus is offering you. He's saying, do you want to follow him? Or do you want to just stay where you're at? You just stay where you're at or you can follow him. What I've discovered when it comes to when God intervenes in my life is, is that he wants me to respond. There's a, there's a little part of us that, that says, I'm not going to jump up like Bartimaeus. I'm just going to delay. I'll think about this. I'll wait. I'll, I'll postpone. But sometimes then those opportunities don't seem to come back. When, when it seems like when the Spirit of God comes and, and, and is doing something, that's the time to respond to what he's doing. And we sense here in, in, in our church that this is the time God's saying, 2016, this is the time to, to think through and say, what is God's call in my life? What is his vision for my life? Where am I supposed to be going? And you respond to that. You know, last weekend we had uh, over 100 people sign up for connect groups. So that's about 200. We, have, we had 100 before that. Now we have 200 people in connect. 100 people said, this is my time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out. And it's not too late. If you're not in a connect group, that's where we're studying this. This is where we have provided materials for you to go through and, 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 and plan out. And we're doing it together. So don't miss this opportunity. Okay, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. I love this last verse here. In Philippians, it says, let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us. And that's, that's certainly me. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, may God clear your blurred vision so you'll see it. Let's pray for that. Father, I just pray for cleared vision. Clear vision. Lord, I also pray against um, anxiety that might come up. There is a lot to be anxious about when we talk about missing our life's purpose. There's a natural gnawing, and it's, uh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing when you know that it's very important. Whenever I do weddings and I'm talking to the groom right before everything's about to unfold, they're usually kind of nervous. And I tell them, I say, that's a good thing to be nervous. That means you recognize something significant is about to happen and it's going to impact your life. It's a good thing to have a certain level of nervousness or anxiety. But not so much that you're crushed under that. God wants to walk alongside you. He wants to help you. That's part of the reason we have the, the body of Christ. The church. Who most of us haven't really thought through life goals like this. But it is worth doing. To get off of the side of the road and say, I'm going to walk with Jesus. Right now, I'm going to invite you to do that. Would you just pray with me? Say, Heavenly Father, I want to respond 
to the way you created me. Help me, give me vision. Some of you just need restored vision. And it begins by asking in faith. Just say, God, I know you can change my situation. Would you pray that? Say, I know you can change my situation. I believe you can change me. And I'm not putting my hope in anything else but you. Then pray, say, God, help me to ignore the negative voices around me and the things I say to myself. Things like you can't do it. You'll never have that dream. Your best days are behind you. You say, God, help me not to listen to that negative, that negative stuff. Help me not to worry about human opinion, to be freed from that emotional disability. And then say, God, show me my my calling. Tell me exactly what you want me to do. Would you do that? Just and say, God, I, I want to be specific. I want to be able to write it down. If you've never put your faith in Christ, just say, Jesus Christ, I want to thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want to start to walk with you. Learn to love you. Learn to trust you. Lord, I thank you for the work of grace that's at work in your people and in your church. Continue to let that flow. In Jesus' name, amen.